Our text this evening is from the prophet Jonah. We're going to look at verses 11 through 16. We're going to read the whole chapter to get the context. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. This is the word of God. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, I'm reading out of the ESV as well. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we might know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do that the sea may quiet down? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up, hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it's because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, Yahweh, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The grass withers and the flowers of the field, they all perish. But the word of our God, it endures forever and ever. And this is God's word. Let us pray. Our dear Father, as the eyes of a servant look to their master, and the eyes of a maidservant to their mistress, so our eyes look to you. We pray that you would give us success tonight as we Look at your word. And we pray, Lord, that your name would be glorified, that Christ might be glorified, that his name would be lifted high, and that we might all rejoice in the God of our salvation, the one who has provided an escape. We ask and pray this in his glorious name. Amen. Amen. Please, please be seated. There are at least two things that storms in our lives reveal. One, 
that there is a God. Second, it reveals who we really are. When the storms of life come upon us, many start to fear. They realize that they can't face life alone. They can't handle the circumstances of the storm. They're not capable of dealing with the situations. They're overwhelmed. They're not adequate. And so almost everyone gets religious, and they call out to a god. Perhaps you've had that in your life. Unbelievers come to you and they say, in the midst of trial, can you pray for me? Or they call out themselves, but nothing happens. They don't receive any help. And this is what happens in our narrative. In the beginning of the narratives, the, the mariners, they cry out to their God, but nothing happens. And then they ask Jonah to call out to his God because they know the storm is getting turbulent. And they awake Jonah and they call him out. Now the text doesn't tell us whether Jonah called out upon his God. We know his spiritual situation. He probably didn't. He was the only person who knew the true and living God, Yahweh, the great God of Israel. And here we have him, silent, surrounded by these unbelievers, and yet nothing to offer. Frantically, these mariners are looking for some help. But Jonah is not able to direct them in their time of crises to the only living God. How sad. And what we learn this evening from our text as we move to the table this evening is twofold. First, that all the storms of life are a precursor of the major storm yet to come. And second, there's a way of escaping the storm, the great storm, and finding refuge in the Lord's provision. So first, the mariner's revealing question. Verse 11. They said to Jonah, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down? From verse 7, we know that, that the mariners found the culprit on whose account this storm had come upon them. And in verse 9, we find, they find out that it's Yahweh, the God of Israel, who is being revealed as the deity who has been offended. He's been angered. And so now in verse 11, the mariners demand a solution. And they demand it of Jonah. Their lives are in danger and they know it. And increasingly so, the text tells us, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And that intensity of the storm is obvious to everyone on, on board. They are, it's bearing down upon them. Now, interestingly, these mariners, they understood that the wrath of God had to be appeased. There was no other way. And so what do they do? They inquire, asking the prophet of God, what should be done? They're saying to Jonah, what punishment must be administered so that we might secure Yahweh's favor? And notice how pointed this question is. Verse 11 says, what shall we do to you? To you, Jonah, what should we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? That's quite a question, isn't it? It's very pointed. They know who, on whose account this storm had come. And their question implies a recognition that some kind of punishment is in order for Jonah. They even offer, notice, to serve as agents of that punishment. 
We will do it. What will we do, Jonah? What shall we do that the sea may quiet down for us? For their own sake, they had to do something with Jonah, or else they would all perish. Jonah's flight from God, from the presence of God, had now imperiled their lives. And by avoiding the responsibility, Jonah forced now a responsibility upon these mariners. And they were caught up in the conflict, you see, of which was not their making. They were just mariners. They were just on their way. And here comes this intrusion, Jonah, an unwilling, disobedient prophet of God. And you see, this is the nature of sin, isn't it? We're not an island to ourselves. Sin, a rebellion of God, always and inevitably draws others into our circle. Others are always brought into the dilemma. And we endanger the lives of others. You see that so obviously here. And you read many, many accounts throughout Scripture. Eli, David, and how their family suffered on account of their sin. And so recognizing that their lives were in danger, these mariners call for action. And they know that Jonah's God was responsible for the intense storm. They realize that. And now they're saying to Jonah, give us a recommendation. What shall we do for the sea to quiet down? And notice Jonah's shocking answer, verse 12 and 13. How does he respond? You ready for this? Pick me up. And hurl me into the sea, and the sea will settle down. That seems extraordinary, doesn't it? Like, that's quite a suggestion. It seems far too drastic. Is this what must happen for the sea to quiet? Wasn't there anything else that could be done? Now, How did Jonah ever come up with such a recommendation anyway? How did he know that this was the solution to the raging of the sea? How did Jonah know that his death would be the solution to the mariner's salvation? There's only one answer. God told him. God spoke. You see, when Jonah's sin was exposed, God's silence was ended. When Jonah and Jonah again spoke as the prophet of God, the man whose witness was silenced by his secret sin now became the mouthpiece for God to the crew that was on the brink of disaster. Pick me up, he said, hurl me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know, Jonah says, it's because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now it seems unconscionable. They too recognize that Jonah was the culprit, but to throw him overboard? seemed too extreme. And notice that Jonah puts the responsibility upon the mariners. Did you notice that? He put the responsibility upon these poor, distraught mariners. He said, pick me up. You pick me up and you hurl me into the sea. Now if you think about this for a minute, what hindered Jonah from just jumping overboard. You know, people do that nowadays, don't they? They go on these cruises and they jump overboard. What hindered Jonah from doing that? Why couldn't he just do or administer his own judgment? Well, we need to recognize that Jonah's suggestion 
was ultimately God's word, a message from heaven. After a time of silence, of Jonah sleeping in the bottom of the ship, he now becomes the mouthpiece of God. And by commanding the mariners to throw him overboard, we notice that God was up to something. God was not just dealing with Jonah. God had something in mind for the mariners and with them throwing him overboard. They were, the mariners, they were meant to recognize that it was Yahweh. It was Jonah's God, the God of Israel. Not Jonah, who would be the source of their salvation. It was God who would save them. And it would be salvation in exactly the way that God declared it would be. And would Jonah overboard. They would understand these things. That's how they would be saved, according to God's word. But acting according to God's word is not always easy, is it? Especially in difficult situations. We know that. We think about these things. We rationalize God's word very often, particularly in situations like this. And we say, isn't there another way? Just like these mariners, isn't there a way to save Jonah? And so quite naturally, they're reluctant to follow Yahweh's recommendation, the word of the prophet. And look at what we read then in verse 13. They heard the word of God, and then we read this. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. But all their efforts were in vain. The harder they tried, Scripture tells us, the more tempestuous the sea became. With every or in the ocean, or the sea. New waves came about. Now, notice in verse 11 here, we have this editorial note by the author. He says in verse 11, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. But now, notice in verse 13. Verse 13, it says the same thing. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous, and then against them. You see that? Against them. They had become cognizant that the storm intensified in response to their attempts to get back to land. The harder they tried, the worse the storm developed. And it was become obvious to the mariners then that Jonah's God was not in favor of their chosen method to try to save Jonah. They had to obey the word of God. And though the mariners desired to save, to spare Jonah's life, it wasn't safe and it wasn't sound. If Jonah's word was the word of Yahweh, the word of the true and living God, the one who is sovereign over the sea and the land, then what they were doing was in direct contradiction to God's word. It was disobedience. The life of the man who spoke the word of God as God's prophet, must be given up by the crew if they were to be saved. That's God's word. And so there's only one solution. And it's Yahweh's solution. All other attempts were futile. And they had finally come to recognize this very thing. There are four words in verse 13 that are the turning point in the mariner's life. And it's these. But they could not. But they could not. 
never left them and rode hard to get back to the dry land, but they could not. It was impossible for them to get back to the land. In other words, they could not get through, we might say, the, the, the raging judgment of God. There was no way possible. The harder they rode to get back to the land, the greater the conflict. Now I wonder, as the people of God, I wonder if you have come to this recognition in your own life. You have tried to live life on your own, to live life the way you would want to live life, apart from God, perhaps, or apart from his word, if you're a Christian and you want to compromise. But the more you do, the more difficult life becomes. That's, as the mariners understood, that's God speaking to us. That's God's way of saying, there's no success apart from obedience to me. There's no success in rebelling against me. And the truth is, the more you try, the worse it gets. But finally, these mariners come to the awareness that all their attempts of doing something to save Jonah and to save themselves was futile. It was absolutely futile. There's only one way for the mariners to escape the judgment of God. Only one way. As courageous as it seemed for the mariners, these were, these were seaworthy men. They were no wimps. But as courageous as it seemed to save Jonah, it was actually very foolish. They thought they could do it their own way. But they had finally discovered that their own way was the way of death. There was only one way of salvation. And as the storm intensified in response to their attempts, they discovered they could not. They could not. Do it on their own. And this teaches us something about the life of the people of God. That doing things according to our own agenda, our own plans, even if we think it's better. You know, as children, as teenagers, uh, we sometimes think we have a better plan. Do it our way. but is never wise. It's always futile. And for the unbeliever, it's even more crucial, isn't it? They are continuing to live a life, doing it their own way. They will not submit their arms, submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, lay down their arms. But it's futile. They cannot escape God's wrath. And so where does that leave the mariners? Well, in verse 14 through 16, we see this amazing plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation. So what must they do for the sea to quiet down? How can they possibly escape the wrath of God? How can they appease the wrath of God? They understand it, that the wrath, the, the ocean or the sea was tempestuous because God was angry. He was angry. Well, there's only one thing to do. There's only one possible way of salvation. Verse 14, therefore they called out to Yahweh, oh Yahweh, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. Now, this is an incredible turn of events, isn't it? Back in verse 5 that we read earlier, when the storm of God's judgment came upon them at the beginning, did you remember what Scripture tells us about them? It says, each, each mariner, 
cried out to their God. The God of the, the God of the sea, the God of the dry land, the God of the sun, the God of the water, the God of the wind. Each mariner, separately, they were calling out to the gods. But now, did you notice? Collectively, collectively, as the people of God, they call out to the only true and living God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, the only God who can save, the God of Jonah, the prophet of the Lord. Amazing. And what a remarkable prayer. This is a remarkable prayer. They pray to the Hebrew God, and they plead with the Hebrew God that they do not perish on account of this man. They ask that they would not be held guilty of innocent blood. Now, they're not implying that Jonah is guiltless, but they did not want to be implicated because they were going to throw him overboard. Amazing. Amazing. And then they make this remarkable confession. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Verse 14. Isn't that credible? How did they know all this? How did they know how to pray to the God of Israel? Through the prophet Jonah. He taught them the word of God. They have come to acknowledge that Israel's God is the only sovereign. That there is no God greater in all the earth. He is the God of gods, as the Psalms speak of him. He is the Lord of lords. And do you hear what these mariners are confessing now? They are confessing that all their gods are worthless. They are worthless. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have hands, but they don't touch. They are worthless gods. But this God, the God of Yahweh, he hears and he answers. He's a God who brings salvation. He's the God of the heavens and the earth. And he alone is worship, worthy of our worship. That's what they say. He's the only one who can quiet the sea. It's a remarkable confession of faith of, in Israel's God. This is the language of so many psalmists and the people of God throughout the psalms. They have come to recognize that Jonah's God is the only true God. And that his way and his word is the only way of salvation. And having made their petition to Yahweh, now the crew turn to this somber task. According to the word of God spoken through the prophet Jonah, they pick Jonah up. They lift him up and they hurl him into the sea. And then the sea immediately ceases its tempestuous action. It ceases from its raging just as Jonah had predicted in verse 12. Now, Jonah might have been a disobedient prophet, for sure, but nevertheless a true prophet of God. How do we know? Well, Moses told us. Moses told us that if a prophet of God predicts the word, the future, and the outcome ahead of time, and in time, then it's fulfilled. It's evidence that he is speaking the word of God. And indeed he was. And this is now in this chapter the third time that the prophet uses the word hurl. Hurl. 
And the author wants us to, wants to make it abundantly clear that the hurling of the mariners recalls and connects the hurling of the wind by the Lord on verse 4. And ultimately wants to communicate that the mariners are acting as agents for Yahweh. Just as the Lord hurled the storm, so now these mariners are acting on God's behalf in this matter. They realize that there is only one thing that will appease the wrath of Almighty God, the God of Israel, as symbolized in the raging sea. And it was the sacrifice of one man. God's storm ended when Jonah was thrown over the board. As he was sacrificed, the ship's crew was saved. Isn't that a great story? I mean, it's a grand narrative back here in the Old Testament. It's such a glorious story. And do you know why? This narrative directs us ultimately to a greater story that concerns all of us much more than just the mariners. It's the way of escape. It's the way of salvation, escaping from the wrath of Almighty God. That's what we have here in this account. God's wrath appeased because of a sacrifice. What the mariners realized, what the mariners realized when they couldn't beat the storm, no matter how desperately they tried, they turned in their desperation to God, to Jonah's God. What he had said through the word, and they staked their whole life upon the sacrifice of this one man, the prophet of God. And of course, then the narrative points us forward, doesn't it? Jonah a beautiful type of Jesus Christ. As Jonah offered himself as a sacrifice to appease the raging storm, so Jesus Christ offered himself up to save his people and to appease the wrath of God's righteous judgment against sin. As Jonah offered himself up. The mariners were saved from the wrath of God. As Jesus Christ offered himself up, all those who put their faith in him are saved from the wrath of God. Our Lord Jesus became the propitiatory sacrifice. Our Lord Jesus, cast out by men, forsaken by the Father, offered himself as the sacrifice that would appease the wrath of God on behalf of us. And it was from all eternity, and then as the scripture said, that he was called the lamb slain from before the foundation of the earth. Just as Jonah did not take his own life by throwing himself overboard, so our Lord Jesus Christ did not take his life. The evangelist Luke, he tells us in his gospel, chapter 23, when they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him. As the mariners lifted up Jonah and hurled him to his death, so wicked men lifted up our Lord Jesus Christ on the tree and gave him over to his death. But like Jonah's word, so it was according to the word of God and the will of God, Isaiah tells us, to crush him. As the mariners confess, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So the apostle Peter, 
in his great sermon on the day of Pentecost, he could write that Jesus was lifted up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Just as Isaiah prophesied, it was the will of the, it was the, will of the Lord to crush him when he would make his soul an offering for guilt. And so you see, my dear friends, it was God's design for our salvation. A design from eternity past. A design so powerfully shown in the old covenant through Jonah. Yes, he was willing to use guilty men. Like these mariners, they too were by nature under the wrath of God, as we are all by nature under the wrath of God. But it was God's gracious plan through the sacrifice of the greater than Jonah that they found salvation. And we find the same salvation from the impending wrath of Almighty God. And you see, this is the good news of the gospel. This is the gospel. Christ is the gospel. Because of our sin and our rebellion, God's judgment has come upon us. There was a mighty tempest of the sea, and we're all caught up in it. All of us. We're all, we might say, in the same boat. There's no one exempt from the wrath of God because there's no one without guilt. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wonder of the gospel and the great news of the Christian faith, the only saving faith, is that though we are guilty before God, in his infinite wisdom, in his tender mercy, in his electing love, he designed a way of escape. Through the one sacrifice of his beloved son, the prophet of God, Jesus Christ. It was Christ who was thrown into the storm of God's judgment on that tree so that through his sacrifice we might be saved. And so the question, can you imagine what these mariners were talking about when they came home to their families? To the to the dock, they're talking about the storm. They're talking about how they were saved from the storm. And they told the story of salvation, that they have come back with one less man. But they're happy. They're joyful. They were saved. But this is the question then for all of us, from the youngest to the eldest, are you saved? Are you saved from the wrath of God? That's what scripture confronts us with tonight. Saved from the wrath to come. Perhaps there are some who don't even know that they're in the storm. You know, you have that. People just live life thinking everything's rosy. They don't even know that there's a storm that is brewing and that it's becoming more and more tempestuous. Is there anyone like that? Perhaps like Jonah, even as a Christian? Obvious, oblivious rather to the wrath of God? Now there are many people like this. They live like this. But this is what we tell the world. Just because you won't acknowledge that there is a wrath, that the storm is building that doesn't mean it isn't. The word of the prophet has told us it is. God's word tells us that outside of Christ, there is no salvation, and the storm is fierce. It is tempestuous. And to use the language of scripture, it is more and more tempestuous. And the only wise thing to do is to be saved. 
by finding refuge in Christ, in a Savior who is not only able to save, but willing to save. A gracious, tender Lord. So how should we respond to the salvation that God has wrought for us as his believers, as his children? We'll notice very quickly, verse 16, the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. More literally, the men feared with a great fear Yahweh. Which shown out of the picture now for just a moment. The spotlight falls on the crew, these mariners. Now, you might think that because the sea was calm, all their fears would vanish. But the startling thing is that we are told now the men feared exceedingly the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? The Lord. With the wrath of God done, no longer hanging over their heads, no longer threatening their lives. There's nothing more to fear around them. And so what's left to fear? Well, Scripture puts it so beautifully, they fear the Lord. They now stand in awe of the majesty, the power, the greatness of God and his salvation his love for them. It was a fear that casts out all other fears, you see. Because of the amazement of the Father's love towards them in Christ Jesus, because of the sacrifice of the one for the many. You know, that's so wonderfully sung by us when we sing that selection, Amazing Grace. We often sing it, but I wonder if we remember or understand what it says. These men weren't cowering before God. They weren't frightened. No, they were fearing God in the sense of awe and wonder. They marveled at it. And it's described in those, that second stanza of that selection, Amazing Grace. "'Twas grace." that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. That's what Scripture is telling us. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. And now notice this fear of the Lord is not just a mere religious sentiment. No, it finds expression as we saw with this, the paralytic this morning. What do they do? Well, we have grateful worship. Look what it says. They feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The author, he's describing the worship with surprise, as, as though shocked that these Gentile mariners would offer acceptable Worship to Israel's God. It's amazing. Literally, they sacrificed sacrifices, it says, and they vowed vows to the God of Israel. Now, it's a surprise, at least for us readers, because the mission of Jonah was to go to Nineveh. But here at the end of the chapter, so gloriously, we find a bunch of pagans Offering acceptable worship to Israel's God. An unexpected twist. A brand new church plant. But isn't this just how our God is? It's just like our God, isn't it? That in his infinite wisdom, he can use and does use human rebellion as an instrument 
to accomplish his holy purpose. Oh, the wonder, the amazement, the glory of it all, of God's grace, his mercy to those who do not ask and yet receive. Amen. Amen. O Lord, our God, our mouths are shut before your majestic holiness, the abundance of your grace and mercy towards wretched sinners. O God, the amazement of it all, the glory of it all, your plan of salvation from all eternity in the only Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Heavenly Father, we can hardly wait to see our Savior, to be embraced by him in his holy temple, and to pay perfect homage and worship before him. And we're so thankful that we can do it each Lord's Day, that we can do it with the entirety of our strength now, but, oh God, to do it perfectly with all the glorious saints, with Jonah, with these mariners who will tell their story of your salvation. And, Father, we thank you that there's only one way of salvation, We'll be telling the same familiar story, but we'll never be tired of it because your grace is amazing. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will never leave us to take this salvation for granted, but that we might always marvel and worship and praise your great and glorious name. And so we thank you for your tender mercies towards us in Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would live as God fears now, that we might live as the children of God, always declaring your praise, and with gratitude then as living lives faithfully before you as the token of our praise. Oh, God, bless your people. And, Lord, if there are some who have not yet embraced our Savior, those who are still under the wrath of God, grant that they might break tonight. They might see the preciousness of the God of Israel, and that they might know that he's not only able to save, but so willing to save that he sent his son. We ask and pray this in his blessed name. Amen. 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 Well, let's rise.